Okay. I think we are live. So Samantha, I want to thank you for being a part of this. Uh, again, these live interviews, like I mentioned when I invited you, are a chance for me to do what I've always done when I was in the military to learn how to be a better army officer. I call it every platoon sergeant, first sergeant, and member of the lieutenant mafia to say, how the heck do you do this? When I was building my company from scratch, I hadn't had any experience in business. So I took people out for one beer at a time to learn how to become a better entrepreneur. And then when it came to COVID, Nobody really knows what's going on. So I started calling people at the beginning of March and late April or late February. And then I realized that the advice I was getting was so good that I wanted to share it with as wide of audience as I can. And so that brings us today to you, Samantha. You are, for people that don't know you, uh, kind of a renaissance person. I mean, you have had experience, not just in academia, you've had a stint at NASA. You've been in the uh, Air Guard as a reservist. You've also been in business. Right now, you're doing all of it at once. Uh, and more than that, what I'm excited is, is you're a friend who is kicking butt, taking names. You won the President's Award at Rice. You were a global badass for WeWork in 2018. Uh, the list of accomplishments uh, far exceeds your age. And at this point, age means nothing because you are out there making it happen hooking and jabbing. And before we get into what you're doing, I just want to thank everybody that's at the front lines of caring for the sick, those healthcare workers. Our hearts go out to that second tier, which are the folks that have lost their jobs and they're immediately out of work. And then that third tier, which of course are those that are trying to figure out how to keep their businesses alive. And that's where I think my skill set, the purpose of these interviews to share best practices but let's face it, from what you've been doing, you're operating simultaneously in all three fights. You're a part of the PPE fight uh, and getting what we need to the front lines. You were serving just recently. We can talk about that in uniform, uh, not just as a civilian, but in uniform until recently as a part of this fight. You also are helping those companies try to stick together. So you are the perfect person to have this afternoon during a thunderstorm. And I understand your puppy in the background is not a big fan of the thunder. So I appreciate you both uh, going through this storm here in Central Texas. And with that, thank you for being here, Samantha. Which, which way do you want to take this question? First of all, how are you doing? And which of all your part of your background do you want to start with first? Sure. Well, first of all, um, thanks for including me. And I look forward to following the interviews from others too. This is, you know, how we derive our inspiration and and hopefully you can share resources. I've, it's been really humbling, both on the military side and the business side, to see people come together. And, and I'm convinced we're all inherently creative because everyone's found fabulous ways to, to problem solve. Um, so I hope, hopefully we, we come out of this um, better humans, having weathered the storm. Um, I would say I'm pretty exhausted, as you can see here from the bags under my eyes. Didn't get a lot of sleep. Um, I just returned from Fort Sam Houston. I was released because um, another, a number of the individuals I was working with um, came down sick very suddenly at the same time. And so it didn't now, make- Do we mean sick or do we mean COVID sick or does it even matter the difference? COVID sick, there was eight people on one shift alone. Wow, um, okay. So, um, yeah, kudos to those. Um, I used to tell army jokes, no offense. And um, Go right I, ahead, I'm gonna dish it right back to the Air Force, don't worry. Never again, um, the things that the men and women in our uniform are doing, you know, despite putting themselves in that situation, just to make sure people get the resources they need is, is really incredible. Um, you know, concurrently, I, I run a, a, a bootstrapped open source social enterprise that has factory in Houston. We manufacture in-house as well as offices in Austin and San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, which, you know, um, in and of itself kind of uh, puts the odds against us in terms of success. And, but we've, you know, stayed scrappy for seven years. This is clearly a time of crisis. And, you know, having customers in 54 countries, um, you know, importing and exporting is a little tricky right now. So Wait, say that again. I want to make sure the viewers know how wide of a, a range of customers you have. You said 54 countries or 54 customers? We have 54 countries that have gigabots. And then um, we serve a number of countries beyond that with our services. But due to the complexity right now of logistics, um, that does, um, and, and the fact that we sell industrial printers means, um, on net 30 terms sometimes means that right now our sales pipeline is extremely compromised. So we are having to be really creative and um, what, what we don't want to do is be in a position to have to um, not be able to support our team. So, you know, we're everyone at Re3D has just been phenomenal and stepping forward and, and thinking through, you know, how, how we can keep the band together and, and hopefully use um, our product and, and our skill sets to serve the community. So let's take a second to kind of step back and say before COVID happened, 
what you were doing in terms of RE3D. Uh, it's a phenomenal. You brief every major VIP that ever comes through the Capitol factory. Uh, at least I've been pleasure, uh, had the pleasure of seeing your brief a couple of times. The Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, I seem to recall, and some other luminaries. But uh, explain what you did back then and talk about the pivot that you're doing now. Sure. So our company um, is a spin out of Engineers Without Borders, NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, we were kind of a concept for a couple of years. And, and that's why you see the legacy.org in our URL. It's re3d.org if you want to check us out. Don't judge the website. We broke it last week in the COVID crisis. With all the I'm going to go on there right now and <laughs> drop sure it. I'm another web developer right after this to hopefully um, bring it up to snap. But um, uh, yeah, so we, um, we have been, you know, fortunate um, to stick to our vision, which is to make 3D printing accessible. We specifically seek to decimate cost and scale barriers so anyone, anywhere, anytime can have a platform to innovate. Um, we focus on um, 3D printing, what we say at the human scale, so things that are functional. Um, and what that looks like for us is our flagship technology, which is called Gigabot, that now goes as big as your budget. We're actually building a six foot printer right now for um, a customer. And um, that re recently in, with the support of the WeWork Creator Awards and the National Science Foundation, um, we have also been able to go a step further besides just making affordable large scale 3D printers from Houston, but also modifying them to 3D print from garbage. Um, so that's been really fun and why some of you guys may have had to sit through some of my pitches because we're always hustling for support, strategic introductions for that. Uh, always hustling is a secret to any entrepreneur or successful person. So I'm going to quote you on that down there. <laughs> Keep going. Um, but, you know, um, and, and the appetite's been great. We're actually selling that product that can print from garbage in beta. Um, there's a lot of demand for it. Um, it prints faster than traditional forms of 3D printing and is allowing more people to use local resources to fabricate. Um, unfortunately, right now, as, as we mentioned with the pandemic and, and shifting priorities, um, we're not pushing as many of those through or contract prints. So um, our team, um, we, you know, we wanna stay busy. We are um, using our CNCs. We have two for access um, CNCs, our fabrication tools, um, our printers to um, support manufacturing PPE um, for um, for the pandemic. So we, um, our teammate Charlotte, um, built a connection with Texas Children's Hospital a few weeks back, and, and was, we were engaged in the open source movements. And um, we've been able to work with the infectious disease department there to design a face shield that meets their requirements that they fielded. Um, so that's been really exciting. And then um, around that time, a lot of people got into the face shield conversation, including our customers, which is so cool in Puerto Rico, that have um, physically relocated their gigabots to one location at a really amazing IoT lab called Engine 4, where they've stood up a giga farm and using um, the face shield plastic that was already on the island and donated to them from a manufacturer on the island they are cranking out thousands of face shields in this like super customer conglomerate. And are they recycling those, creating new ones, or they're just adding to what's already there? Um, I would say, unfortunately, right now, uh, probably single use plastic consumption has gone up. Um, yeah. We are contributing to, we're, we're engaging with the Houston community in, in um, some conversations around ways to maybe sterilize PPE, but um, due to the little um, information we have right now about the virus, um, a lot of a lot of the um, PPE is just discarded after one use, or, or, they're, or they're wearing it for a long time because that's all they have. So um, I would say we're um, <clears throat> probably um, guilty of maybe adding to the waste conversation that we were hoping to take away from initially. Right now, right now, I'll let you feel a little bit better that with fewer people driving, the carbon offset is such that you should feel guilt-free when you go to sleep at night. That makes uh, because. Sense. Yes, because the first tier, of course, is always those people on the front lines of fighting this. But when you talk about your customers having now to pivot what they're doing and how that's changing and you're enabling them, describe a little bit what that looks like both here in the States and including Puerto Rico, uh, yeah. or perhaps, as you say, the supply chain and the risk to be able to get all of that through the supply chain. What's that look like? Yeah, so it's interesting. So internally, we're doing everything we can to stay viable and taking production requests from um, medical professionals that have specific needs that can't be satisfied by, say, the maker community. But we have decided that all of our locations um, should also be physical repositories for the amazing nonprofits that are standing up and just the makers. So who might have one in their local library or in their house that are, are quarantined right now to actually right. designs that have been vetted by the NIH through the NIH print exchange. 
And how are they getting those uh, prints or plans so that they know how they can contribute? Yeah, so the National Institute of Health stood up a resource for, um, it's called a 3D print exchange for, for um, groups like us and, and hobbyists to share designs and healthcare providers. look it up while you're talking. They're a print exchange. Up. Yep. And then there's groups, amazing groups in Austin. It's called Mass for Docs in Houston. TXRX Labs was a big part of it and Baker Ripley, but they, there are groups in almost every community we're seeing around the world that recognize the shortage of PPE for doctors. And so they're mobilizing the maker communities to make the, the headbands for face shields or other objects that are in need. And then they're um, aggregating it, assembling it, and distributing it to hospitals. So for all of our locations, concurrent with satisfying needs that the company is getting, we are serving as a vehicle for the maker community to contribute. So we're pleased to say for those Austinites that may be tuned in, um, our teammate Brian, who's an ROTC student, um, is currently setting up boxes at Brew & Brew in the Draft House pub. Um, this will serve as a collection point for any of you nerds like us that would like to, not to accuse you of being a, a nerd, but I'll out you, um, nerd. <laughs> to, to make a headband on your own printer. You can, um, there'll be a link to, we're going to put on our blog tonight where you can get the instructions for the file. You can drop it off at those locations. We'll aggregate it for you and make sure it gets to the doctors that need it. Um, and Mass for Docs will do the assembly. In Houston, our factory is a drop-off location. We're receiving up to 300 donations every six hours. The boxes are overflowing. Wow. And then we're hoping to aggregate that for a TXRX so they can assemble it for Memorial Hermann. In San Juan, Puerto Rico, we're, um, we're supporting collection at Engine 4 as well as on the west side of the island. So if you're in either three of those locations, hopefully our website, if you go to re3d.org yep. forward slash news. I put the link in there. We'll have a COVID response blog we're going to update. Um, for you to be able to um, contribute, um, if you would like, um, to, the, to the cause in those cities, and we can help plug you in. Beyond that, here's what's so rad. We have these customers in 54 countries that are going through the same strife that we are right now. Many of them have created jobs around their Gigabot or use it as a tool for their shop. Right. And, um, and, and, and groups from all over the world, what we've started seeing on social media are using their Gigabot for the same, uh, for their local maker movement um, to manufacture face shields. Um, so we're um, batching the, the stories that we've identified. Um, if you go to our blog right now, again, it looks a little bit funny because we're updating our website. Um, there's a blog we posted yesterday of the first six stories. Um, and you can see, you know, a gentleman from Turkey, people in Aruba, and um, in New York City, right in the thick of it right now, as well as in Texas, who are working and using their gigabots to make a difference. So um, we're hoping that, you know, our customers can be a vehicle and they could help propagate, you know, support. And, and anyone with a printer right now has the opportunity um, to, to plug in. Um, if you're in a community and you don't know where you can... Um, how you can support the cause uh, with your resources, please reach out to us and, and we're happy to um, connect you. Okay, well, in in um, in exchange for all that great data, because I'm a, a, a team of one here, I mean, I look left and right and it is the window and the door. I just wanna make sure that when your team posts that, if you or somebody can remember to throw it in, not only to this Facebook link right now, but also later, or not now, but later. And then later this afternoon when I post this on LinkedIn to drop it in there because there's two different audiences and we might catch the right person, not yeah. just in one of the three communities that you talked about, but maybe even some of your customers in the 54 countries that are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're at that halfway point here because these conversations are short and sweet. So I want to turn to something that maybe not a lot of people are talking about. And you alluded to it a little bit, but uh, it's something that people need to be mindful of with so many reservists and members of the guard, as well as even now members of the independent ready reserve, the IRR. These are people that are everyday business people in your communities that you think of as uh, right next to you as civilians, but they've been now called back into uniform and they are every much a part of this fight, but they have companies, they have their own resources, they have their own payroll, they have their own people. I understand it's hard to find resources for that unique niche of business leaders who are now military leaders in terms of their new capacity. What do you know that's out there? What have you been told? And then I guarantee I'm going to make that a personal mission going forward to get you the resources that you need. So what is the landscape right now? What does it look like uh, for those true citizen soldiers, citizen airmen, citizen Navy people, whatever the hell they call sailors, I guess. I don't know. I don't talk Navy. But anyway, go on. What is it like? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, you know, that's what's, what's crazy is I don't know. I have, you know, reached out to Bunker Labs, Jonathan and Sabrina have been um, amazingly supportive um, as well as the Alice community for women. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting about being a reservist um, and also a CEO is um, I'm not a veteran. Until the day I take my uniform off, I'm actively serving. So it kind of puts me in a weird class anyway that sometimes limits resources that are available to us. Um, and almost in, in some cases may even incentivize someone to leave the military, um, which is which is too bad. Um, because as we've seen right now, this is this is probably where we're most needed because we get it. DOD is managing the response and the supplies right now. So I can appreciate where the demand is and then help mobilize these amazing groups that want to help it um, on the civilian side. Um, in, in terms of specific resources, I'm not aware of any, um, but if anyone in the community is, I would love, I know Bunker Labs would love to and, and other networks to help share that because this is probably, I mean, minus the hurricanes in 2017 when I was deployed in Korea, which is another story. Um, this is one of those rare moments um, where I'm just, I'm completely spent and I don't know where to go. I feel like what I'm doing in both capacities is the right thing. Um, and more importantly, I'd love to see a community um, uh, uh, come out of this where, where us reservists that, that have that dual hat can support each other because um, it is a really unique position. Yeah. Oh, I mean, trust me, you, you hit me right here in the heart with that one. It is something that I'm going to work on to be able to figure out either A, who is in charge of it. And if I can't find anybody in charge of it, I'm going to raise the flag up to the point where we get some attention on the subject because we've absolutely got to have it. Uh, so with just a couple minutes left, let's pivot to one last thing, which is, and this is just the human side of all this. How are you transitioning? How are you pivoting? How are you as a person in terms of your daily rhythm, your daily ability to lead or take care of yourself and take care of others around you? How has that changed, first of all? And because of your unique experience in the military, how do you think that has prepared you for this very moment? And you alluded to it a little bit with your time in Korea during the hurricanes, but I'd love for you to expand on it. Yeah, so I say um, this week, I got to stop swearing so much. So I'm going to work quite on that. All right. These are live and raw and real. And if it hurts anybody's feelings, they don't have to tune in next time. No, but I, I would say, um, so I picked up maybe some change like for the worse. I find like right now, just because I, when I see the need, um, you know, in, in my time in our North, I'm just rolling off of that today. And that's Army North that you're talking about? Northern, Army Northern Command. Yep. Um, you know, I just, I see the urgency and then you know, when, when our company is getting like these pleas from healthcare providers, I see it twice. And so yeah. I think I have this heightened sense right now that's making me, you know, I, I, when you're in the startup community, I think you're impatient anyways. Like you just right. never move fast enough, even though they're going a mile a minute. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, like there's, we're just, you know, there's just not enough time and we're not moving fast enough. Um, but I would say in terms of the military, you know, one really interesting thing um, about officer school is, you know, in some of the professional development we have to go through along the way, I just had captain school last year, is they, in, they are constantly putting you into simulations um, that create what they call the fog of war. So you can exercise um, quick decision making and focus on prioritization. I, I can think of, you know, it, it, there's been times I thought some of the scenarios were hokey or whatnot, because as a disgruntled camp captain, you like to criticize everything in the Air Force, but. In the like, Army, we did it the same in the Army. But there's been times in the last couple of weeks um, where I, I find myself wanting to maybe react a certain way and then I'm going through the check or the, or the, um, the counseling I remember receiving when, when you know, the Air Force was sharing you know, how your frontal lobe works and, and, and mapping and how you can respond or influence you know, your attitude or your behavior in different situations. And I, I find myself actually referencing that. So that's been really interesting. Um, you know, the upside for V3D is we were conditioned during the hurricane. So three cat fives hit our company in the span of like six weeks. Um, wow. while I was in Korea um, a couple years ago and, and Bunker and the community and yourself and everyone was, was great. But I think because of that, for our team, we're like, the only, the only difference here is like, we don't know when it will end, but right. we've had a little bit of practice. And, and because of that, um, we, um, have, we, we do rely on a lot of digital tools and certain, pro we're very process driven. That probably comes from the military and NASA. Um, and, and we have a lot of good documentation and, and we focus on backups. And as a leader, I know that, you know, while, it, you know, everyone always has a tendency to, to want to micromanage at times, like we have amazing people on our team that we can trust can be, you know, very independent and self, self-sufficient. So um, I think, you know, identifying those hires and setting up those resources came out of, you know, past taskings that maybe I've had. 
and have served us really well as, you know, we've had to shut down for a couple of days when um, someone was exposed. And as we implement, you know, limited contact in, in the shop and, um, and as we think through how we support each other too on the yep. team, when, you know, we have to pause for our family or for our own health. Yeah. Well, that's something fascinating that, as you mentioned it, that I hope that the listeners that are there that um, are at home and they're bored, some of them might be, if they're fortunate enough to not be in a place where they have to work uh, and they might be complaining about the fact that they've watched everything on Netflix that's available and or there are no new movies on Apple iTunes. Tiger King is a good one. Yes. What I hope that they do when they get that feeling of frustration and they have that feeling like I just got to go and get out and go sneak into here or sneak into there or go visit this person is to remember how hard people like you all are working, especially as you described it in a unique situation of being in uniform, seeing all the coordination required from the national security and national emergency side of it to then being in the private sector and seeing it from the business sector, trying to organize and marshal all these resources. Would you say uh, and maybe you don't know the answer to this. I'm just curious because we're talking in real time. Is there coordination being done more on the military or the government, specifically civilian elected leaders or bureaucracy at, at any level? And are there areas where someone like myself, who's got experience in both, could fill in a gap and maybe tighten up some of it? Because again, we are talking about chaos management at the end of the day. There are no right answers. Yeah, the one thing I, um, I have to say, and we got reminded of a lot um, when I was serving in my Air Force hat in the Army and kind of the center of it um, is, you know, we are constantly, you know, we are vectoring that, you know, the federal response is like, you know, last in, first out. Like we are, you know, we respect the Constitution and, and how, how things flow in scenarios like this is, um, and rightly so, is, you know, we, we support at the local level and then at the state level. And then at the federal level, um, it's been interesting. And in, in, in this instance, because, um, you know, and being in three communities, we have watched that happen in real time. And part of what has happened is there are like task force that have formed, if you will. There's one, a great one that formed early on for the state of Texas. But then there's also been local responses, like what we've seen in Houston, I would say more so than, than Austin in terms of like the PPE sh shortage, but now they have a great marketplace as well. Yep. Um, in, in Puerto Rico, watching it, you know, the science, working with the Science and Research Trust, seeing the mobilization in San Juan and then most recently in Mayawas and in Ponce as well. So I would say um, there are a lot of people trying to help. I feel some of the feedback I get um, is that there's just so much noise. People just don't know where to plug in. I think that will sort itself up, out. And we have to remind ourselves that a lot of these, um, these resources just stood up in the last two to four weeks. And sure. it might be good that there's more than less um, just so everyone has a chance to do something. Um, but I think that consolidation is, is probably needed to some degree right now. So tools like the NIH print ex exchange, ex for example, for people in 3D printing, at least they've got one official place to go. There's a lot of other places where awesome designs are getting um, shared, but it's just like that, that validator. So anything I think individuals like yourself or others can do to help provide that authority and clarity and organization. Um, there's a group right now, um, and um, Diane and, and JR sit on it. Um, there's a task force that is formed to help with that federal response and thinking through like a, a marketplace, if you will. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the local levels needed and the federal level. It just depends on, you know, where it's appropriate to tap in. Um, what I would say, I think the biggest gap is, is in the many on the manufacturing side is we talk a lot about that tactical solution and designs, but we've got to think about raw materials. Where are those pellets going to come from that run, um, that create filament for printers and are used in injection molding? What is the, how is that fabric created that we need for that mass? So anything I think we can do to make sure that raw materials are getting put into those supply streams, anything that we can do to help companies convert over um, like our own, or, you know, maybe a company that was making X, Y, or Z widget, like the car companies, having them flip over to make PPE, anything. And now they're doing ventilators help. sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I come from Detroit. I have family members that are unemployed. They want to get back to work. We don't want you know, the economy to, to, to pause, especially when there's need and, and they have the capacity. So anything we can do to support those conversations is needed, even if it's too much from my perspective right now. Yep. Well, I think that really is kind of the, the motto of all this. Let's do more than we think is needed right now, because it's easier to pull back than it is to come up short. Uh, and then the other thing, just to reiterate what you said, and we've said this in many of the interviews, anybody that wants to help can help in some capacity, whether it's with your time, 
your talent or your treasure. Uh, in this particular case, like I say, I'm not able to be working on the front lines uh, and not in a position of government to be able to help those immediately out of work. But where I'm trying to put my resources forward are helping those businesses that are struggling or that are being stretched then survive. And you today, Samantha, has given me my latest uh, uh, orders, if you will, which is to figure out where these resources are. And if they aren't there, then to continue to raise the flag until someone says, oh, shit, we need to figure that one out too, because that's something we hadn't thought of. And that's not necessarily one's fault. This is a very unusual place, especially because, and you didn't mention this specifically, but you alluded to it, the difference between Title 10 and Title 32, and all these archaic laws that we never imagined, you know, uniform federal troops perhaps being deployed to help internal to lots of different things going on. So let's see what we can do to help. All right, as we wrap up, anything that I didn't ask you that you wanted to share and anything you forget later, by the way, you can just throw links into Facebook or LinkedIn, but anything you want to leave folks with before we close out? Sure, I would say if you want to reach out to us, go to re3d.org. Um, and the links below. Our updates. Um, and then again, yeah, support support the fabrication of raw materials. Let's, let's lean forward so next time we can be more flexible. Um, just, you know, in, in transparency for those that are wondering, you know, our company, I, I don't know how I'll make payroll in a month and um, the loan, this, the loan assistance, you know, we're, we're still in the application process right now with JP Morgan Chase. So um, anything anyone can do to help, help companies, you know, the small businesses to large ones alike, figure out how to work that bridge or mobilize those resources faster, I think is, is going to be a priority to, to keep these companies viable. Yeah, I have heard and I hope I heard wrong that some of those loans that you're referring to are first come first serve. And like Wells Fargo announced the other day, they have run out of money and resources. And basically, if you weren't at the front of the line, you don't get any. Uh, I expect that our elected leaders at all levels will be able to figure out a way to uh, pull us through that. But Samantha, again, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, you say you feel like you're stretched thin and look tired, but you look great to us in terms of being... <laughs> motivate and energize. It's inspiring for people like me to know there's a way to help. And I'm going to be sticking on this till I figure something out or uh, find the person that's in charge to put them in a place where they can help not just you, but all the other companies that fall into that niche of whose CEOs or senior leaders are now being called back to be able to serve in uniform again in their dual capacity as a citizen soldier. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to everyone's questions. Yep, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Samantha. Take care.